Hi, I'm Jay Kuhn, CEO of Risk-Based Security. Welcome to this edition of The Right in Security, the show which we spend time talking with leaders and veterans in the security space, tackling the issues of the day. Today, I'm joined by Steve Christie Coley, who I'm sure I'll refer to just as Steve Christie because I'm not even sure I pronounced the very last part right. Uh, Steve is a principal information security engineer in the cybersecurity division at the MITRE Corporation. Steve's been in cybersecurity for quite some time, actually dating back to 1993. That's the long hair version of Steve, if you remember that. He's probably most well known for being the co-creator uh, and editor of the Common Vulnerability and Exposure List, better known as CVE, and actually the chair of CVE. Also in 2002, he was a co-author of a pretty influential uh, draft paper uh, called Responsible Disclosure, Responsible Vulnerability Disclosure Process that he, that he authored with Chris Weissoppel. Now, Steve is currently supporting the FDA CDRH on medical de uh, device cybersecurity. In addition, he uh, is the technical lead for several projects, including Common Weakness Enumeration, also known as CWE, Common Weakness Scoring System, CWSS, and also the community-driven CWE SANS Top 25 Software Most Dangerous Software Errors. Steve, it's great seeing you. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Glad to be here, I think. Uh, you think. Well, today... I want to spend some time talking about medical vulnerability management and common weaknesses. And I put the sizz on there because there's a lot of them. So we'll, 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 we'll try to cover as much as we can today. I'll try to avoid any CVE conversation, but it might slip, but I will try to be on my, my best behavior. So let us start off with some medical device security. In 2016 at RVA set, you gave a presentation and it was called Toward Consistent Usable Security Risk Assessment of Medical Devices. And at that time, you and your colleagues were really just getting started in the space. Can you sort of give us a quick recap of that talk and what you were focused on at that time? Uh, sure, at that time, um, back in 2016, my colleague Penny Chase and I had been supporting FDA for about a year or two as the FDA tried to really get a handle on uh, medical device security. Uh, external vulnerability researchers, independent researchers, were starting to find vulnerabilities within medical devices at increasing rates. Uh, they were having difficulty in interacting with medical device vendors who were uh, sometimes dismissive of what their findings were. And FDA, who's a regulator of medical devices, wound up getting uh, sort of involved and kind of uh, stuck in the middle. And um, some of the work that I did in the early days supporting FDA involved um, really helping them to drive towards resolution of some of these vulnerabilities, especially when there were disagreements between the medical device researchers and the manufacturers. Um, one of the things that really came out of even that early work was recognizing that the researchers were at that time mostly only looking at the technical impacts of the vulnerabilities and the medical device manufacturers who are affected were often coming at it from a safety only perspective medical device vulnerabilities themselves were still fairly new to them so um, with that kind of disconnect there that was occurring that that we were seeing right up close in the disputes that were happening, sometimes behind the scenes, sometimes publicly, um, made it clear that a more consistent approach to evaluating medical device vulnerabilities was important. So we had just started that work um, uh, at the end of 2015 and early 2016. And RVA SEC, I think, was, um, was still in the very early stages. At the time, we were like, hey, we need some kind of consistency in how people approach vulnerabilities. We need to be sure that medical device manufacturers account for hospital environments appropriately, that the uh, vulnerability researchers understand that the there might be vulnerabilities that from a technical perspective look bad, but from an operational perspective 
might not necessarily be that bad. So, you know, um, how do we uh, how do we ensure that they're that everybody's at least looking at and discussing and considering the same kind of thing? So, some of what I talked about at RVA Sec was really laying out what were some of these areas, what were some of these difficulties that existed. And for an approach to be taken, what would be the requirements for a good approach? You want something that's repeatable. You want something that's um, consistent. You want something that is um, fairly simple to apply. And so um, what we started doing right after um, the RVA SEC talk um, was uh, not, not like right after. I mean, it, I, I, I had a weekend. Um, but we really started actively thinking about, okay, what are the approaches that are out there? Uh, do they have some of these criteria for what a good metric is or a good um, risk analysis approach is? And um, we moved from there. We talked to a number of different medical device manufacturers. We talked to some vulnerability researchers. We even talked to some uh, medical clinicians and um, um, to some to some. We also talked to some contacts that we that we knew through various hospitals because of the FDA work and other work that we've been doing um, just within healthcare in general um, and medical device security. So we did uh, Shocker, a community-based approach, talking to a lot of different kinds of stakeholders, getting a lot of their different perspectives, and then figuring out how do we how do we try and integrate that. And um, from the beginning, we had been thinking a bit about CVSS, the IT Enterprise CVSS, which at the time was, I'm not sure if version three had been released at that point, or maybe it was still fairly new, but CVSS was a known recognizable entity. People were already trying to use CVSS to go and evaluate medical device vulnerabilities. It was being applied in other areas just to IoT and so on. So it seemed a natural place to, to really look at things. And so what we wound up doing was really saying, okay, there's the CVSS end result, which is a score and the vector, and the different parts of the vector cover the individual different um, aspects, the different characteristics of the vulnerability that are important that then ultimately produce a CVSS score. Um, but for us, the thing that the thing that we thought was really important was to be a little bit more clear about the process of ensuring that somebody is looking at all of these different aspects of a vulnerability within a healthcare setting. So we hit upon the notion of really developing a rubric as a series of different questions that would be asked, uh, and at the end result would be a CVSS vector. Uh, what we also call an, an extended vector, which includes additional questions and additional data inputs that then would produce a CVSS uh, relevant score. And we um, did a couple pilot programs with a number of different medical device manufacturers uh, a few years ago. Went to Minnesota in February, so that was fun. Um, and then we just uh, uh, got a lot of good feedback from those medical device manufacturers. We had them score some real world vulnerabilities that were in their own products. We had them look at um, uh, hypothetical vulnerabilities or hypothetical scenarios that we created. Um, and so we were able to get a lot of input, a lot of real solid feedback over, over time um, to really help us to develop the rubric. And we initially publicly released a version of the rubric, I think back in 2019. And um, just, uh, just a few months ago, at the end of 2020, it was approved by FDA as a um, medical device development tool, which is um, unusual because it's a metric in a rubric and a process, not a specific tool that people use to help them in evaluating their medical devices. So that's the, believe it or not, the short version. <laughs> well, I knew you were going to have a lot to say today. And uh, there, there, there were, you dropped a lot of information on us there. Now, what I will say is, is I did recently rewatch your, your talk. And in uh, some ways, it's great that it's still relevant today. Um, it's a great talk, and we'll put it in the show notes for people to look at. In some other ways, it's a little sad that it's still relevant today. I feel like you can potentially give that talk and a lot of the the issues that we're focused on are still relatively the same. Is there, if you had to just pick one and concisely tell me, is 
Is there anything that when you were starting off and you and your colleagues were working on this again in that 2015, 2016 time, anything that's changed or, or you've had a, a completely different focus on in that time? Um, there's quite a bit of change that's happened across the industry. I think one big change that has happened when it comes to specifically to risk assessment with medical devices is that there's a growing understanding that um, uh, there are limitations to traditional safety and hazard analysis, which makes assumptions about likelihood of exploitation or likelihood of events occurring. And um, cybersecurity just turns that on its head, right? Uh, you could estimate from a safety perspective the frequency in which a bit flip would occur in an embedded device because of radiation leaks. And that's actually something that literally happened to a medical device researcher one time, Marie Mo, who is a pacemaker patient as well. And she was 30,000 feet in the air or whatever, and a bit got flipped in her pacemaker. And it accidentally inadvertently allowed her to then go and do some reverse engineering on the pacemaker once it had been removed and replaced. Um, but those kinds of, even those kinds of obscure events from a safety perspective are estimatable. You can estimate the likelihood in which these things will occur. You can, you know, monitor your entire ecosystem and figure out approximate um, rates at which, say, somebody inad inadvertently puts in the wrong setting, manually enters the wrong setting into a medical device that's attached to the bedside. You can come up with some pretty good math and pretty good estimates when you're thinking that way. But cybersecurity turns that on its head. Um, when you get down to likelihood of exploitation, um, you also have, you know, considerations like difficulty of exploitation. But, you know, if somebody releases a fully functioning exploit, then suddenly the difficulty is more or less uh, not there anymore, right? You still have other aspects of complexity for how somebody could attack a medical device? Do they need to be physically within Bluetooth distance? Um, or is it something that's connected on the internet? But then there are also these safety components, built-in um, defenses that are there strictly for safety purposes that um, actually inadvertently provide some defense in depth from a cybersecurity perspective. And so I think there's a, grow, a growing understanding, at least within the medical device cybersecurity community, that there's still quite a bit of work that needs to be done to integrate safety considerations with cybersecurity um, vulnerability considerations, where the laws of physics, so to speak, just don't apply. Although safety itself has such a long 50 plus year history, even just with respect to medical devices. You know, I, I think when, um you talk to anyone about medical things, I think almost immediately they understand there's a little bit of uniqueness when it comes to the safety impact and even the availability <laughs> impact much, much greater than most security professionals maybe consider. But I think a lot of people do still struggle with what's so different about the security of medical devices compared to other IoT devices or other devices that security folks have been handling for decades. And why can't we just use normal standards like CVSS and things like that? But what do you say to someone that, that doesn't want yet another unique standard and that wants, you know, some of these things to be applied um, to, you know, practices that security professionals are already put in place? Um, I don't know what it's like with other verticals. This is the first real vertical that I've gotten kind of deeply involved in. There's, there is some reluctance perhaps to bring on new standards, but there's also, I feel, a, um, uh, because the medical device area is a regulated industry, um, medical device manufacturers don't want to screw up, so to speak, and they're looking for good solid guidance and it's still pretty early on in terms of dealing with vulnerabilities within medical devices. Although it has a long history, it's still fairly early in terms of the frequency of discovery and how much FDA is really actively pushing 
um, manufacturers, to be clear. So the medical device manufacturers uh, within the context of a regulated industry may lean a little bit more heavily on recommendations for certain kinds of standards that are um, that are accepted. And there are some medical specific standards that are out there that involve secure design of medical devices and so on. The CVSS rubric part is just really about evaluating vulnerabilities, those that have been discovered um, in the post market after the medical devices have been deployed. But there is, there is a fairly heavy reliance on standards, um, even though they are not ex there are not many standards that are explicitly required by FDA. There's, there's really a desire to still support a certain amount of flexibility in giving manufacturers as much opportunities as possible to really produce, you know, life-saving or, or, or patient-supporting medical devices um, that nonetheless are still safe, including from cybersecurity attacks. And I accidentally didn't answer your question, but um, that was just an accident, I swear. <laughs> so the, the availability part of medical devices, I, I really do find fascinating. I think most early on security professionals, when they were taught the information security triad, right? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability, Availability was always a, I don't get it, I don't get it. Um, but we at, at Risk-Based Security, we've been talking to a lot of medical organizations and, and clients uh, that are really worried about the availability part, right? And they're not willing to do vulnerability scans because there was that one time that it caused an outage because when you're actively touching devices, there could be problems. And, you know, security tools are supposed to be helpful, not create a, an outage or, or, or cause a problem. And I, I think it's one of the things that you know you and I have talked about over the years, the focus on vulnerability intelligence and not scanning. But I want to get your thoughts on another availability issue that's going on, ransomware. Hospitals and medical facilities are seeing a substantial availability issue, right? Just in October of last year, there was a bunch of malware gangs, you know, wrecking havoc on the healthcare system. I think it was like two dozen hospitals were hit by various ransomware, like TripBot and other things. Um, what are your thoughts about, you know, these malware gangs going after hospitals, you know, and, and then, and I guess any recommendations uh, from your standpoint to hospitals? Um, yeah, so this, this gets more into, um, into the healthcare industry side of things, maybe not so much about medical devices. Uh, historically, medical devices have maybe been a point of entry into a hospital network. Um, but now these days, at least for mature hospitals, they're trying to do what they can to isolate those medical devices onto separate networks and so on. Um, there is not yet a proven case in which a patient has died as a result of ransomware, but it really just seems like a matter of time. Um, there have been significant delays in delivery of care to patients. That has happened um, for ransomware, and so that is a that is a concern that directly hits in hospital networks and hospital operations. Even if it doesn't necessarily get to the point of medical devices that are treating patients, you still need to be able to take in a patient. You still need to be able to move medical device records around for patients. You still need to be able to physically move them within different rooms and different floors of a hospital. You need to be able to track, you know, what their allergies are, um, what are the, what is the current treatment, and be able to provide therapy on a timely basis. And so ransomware um, is becoming a, a significant concern. WannaCry was a really bad example of that, right? And that was a couple of years ago already with the, especially with the British National Health System. Um, and so those are some significant concerns to hospitals, but especially these days with uh, COVID and so on, uh, there, uh, um, it, it's, it can be very difficult to really have sufficient resources and sufficient technical expertise to even manage ransomware. Um, one stat that um, Josh Corman of I Am The Cavalry uh, talks about fairly frequently is um, even within the United States, um, there's a very large percentage, and I forget the number, 
but it's uh, more than 50% of, of hospitals don't have a dedicated security person, right? So the, the amount of potential risk that's out there for ransomware is really pretty significant. And in a way, I'm a little bit surprised that there haven't been more incidents, um, but uh, one doesn't need to be an expert in um, understanding all of the different threat actors to know that there are threat actors out there uh, for whom um, killing people is not necessarily a major concern if they have other kinds of goals, such as significant financial gain, um, or you get into nation state areas and concerns, um, so on. But right now it is a significant problem further complicated by, uh, by COVID. When, what do you, what do you say to the hospital or that medical provider that says, Steve, telling me about a vulnerability just doesn't do anything for me for these medical devices. Cause they're just sort of these black boxes that we don't know what's going on in them, meaning no visibility. And even if there was visibility, there's no ability to patch or fix anything or do anything other than these sort of like create air gaps. And I think if you start getting, you know, manufacturing folks in the conversation, you know, about relying just on air gaps, what do you say to them? And then are there other sort of recommendation of these medical devices? Like you just mentioned, a medical device could be a, you know, a, a vector to something else that leads to ransomware, et cetera. So, so it is a concern about these medical devices, right? Um, yes, that's definitely a, that's definitely a concern. Segmentation and isolation, um, is one of the things that is, um, frequently rec uh, recommended. Um, I think it's a, uh, many cybersecurity professionals in healthcare, uh, recommend that as one of the, um, as one of the best things to People might go, well, why don't you just go medical devices in the first place? Um, you know, many of them are not even patchable or some of them rely so heavily on older versions of operating systems and so on, um, that to patch them would be to risk their ability to deliver therapy or to monitor patients or to provide diagnosis. Um, so there's a huge problem of these legacy devices uh, that uh, just can't simply be removed. And so isolation is one approach that, um, that can often be taken. Uh, it really depends though specific on the different hospitals and so on uh, for what they can do. But it can be really difficult to secure your assets, your medical devices or otherwise, if you don't even understand what your assets are, uh, let alone if you don't understand what kinds of software are in those assets in the first place that might contain vulnerabilities. Uh, a lot of medical devices can be deployed on embedded operating systems or commercial operating systems using commercial or open source software that then winds up not getting updated. And you could have a significant vulnerability that comes out, say in a, you know, SSL, open SSL component or something like that. And you don't even know what medical devices might be using that open SSL component. About a year ago, there was the uh, swing tooth family of 11 or 12 uh, vulnerabilities related to Bluetooth low energy. Um, before then, there was another set of vulnerabilities involving uh, IP stacks within embedded libraries that was in embedded software and embedded operating systems dating back decades, um, which was unsupported, but nonetheless was really embedded very deep within these medical devices. And so it became, so it's very difficult sometimes to even know what vulnerabilities there are in those medical devices. And this is a known and understood problem um, certainly within healthcare, and I think to some degrees across IoT, um, but uh, this is where efforts such as the Software Bill of Materials or SBOM, S-B-O-M, uh, comes into play. If each medical device had its own Software Bill of Materials, you could then know which medical devices had which vulnerabilities involving third-party components. This is an effort that's been actively led by Alan Friedman of the NTIA, which is in, um, which is part of uh, U.S. Department of Commerce, 
And um, this SBOM effort has been going on for a few years. And I, I think they're making quite a bit of progress. Uh, and they even have a dedicated working group towards looking at healthcare. So healthcare may be leading the way in adoption or at least understanding what the strength and benefits are of a software bill of materials. But if you don't know what it is, you can't secure it, right? So, but at least some of this work is underway to get a better handle on that. So you haven't said cyber physical systems yet. Are you still apologizing or not apologizing when you say this, or have you stopped saying cyber physical systems? Um, if I use it, I will not apologize for it. <laughs> um, I, 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 you know, I, I think some of these academic, some of these discussions are almost academic, right? And, and it gets really pedantic and it's, it's ironic that I'm the one saying this because I care a lot about terminology, but ultimately you can't get everybody to agree to a single concrete definition of anything. So uh, if you can get as close as you can to ensure that people have the appropriate shared agreement on what something means, um, that's great. But if I say cyber physical, you kind of know what I mean, right? And if I, it, you can't just replace that with some other random words or something like that. And yes, I do work for a government contractor. We use cyber as a noun, not me, but uh, many of my colleagues do. Um, and that's just kind of the way that it, uh, I, I think that's just the way it is. We have much more important things to talk about and to figure out than coming to a full, complete agreement on what certain terms mean or which terms we're allowed to use or not. Um, a really good example uh, that I came up with inadvertently about a year ago within uh, the CWE project was um, CWE really, uh, we're, we try and deal with many different kinds of um, terms and figure out how do we describe mistakes in terms that are understandable to everybody that's out there. And I picked a term authentication or a term authorization and I looked at a bunch of NIST documents to see what the definitions were. NIST, right, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, I think it is. Um, but this, you know, the, the big standards organization had 20 different documents with 20 different definitions just of authentication. And you would think that that word is a really well-defined word that everyone has a complete agreement about. But um, I'm not going to give up on trying to be better about terminology. But ultimately, some of these some of these disagreements, I think, serve as a distraction. Uh, makes sense. And I have a bunch more questions about medical device stuff, but we're going to have to save that for another time because I want to move along here uh, into the common weaknesses. And you just started touching on CWE, the common weakness enumeration. Now, from my understanding, version four point three was just released in December. Um, 2020, so that's that's great. But I actually don't believe that everyone really understands CWE. Can you try to distill down what is uh, what is CWE and why people should care in, in, in a way that they'll understand? So, if you know about CVEs. Right, those are individual vulnerabilities within individual products. I'm not asking you, Jake, if you know about CVEs, because I know you know about well, CVEs. And I didn't say CVE, you did, just, yeah. just for the record. That's right, that's, oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh-oh, now I'm, now I'm in for it. Um, CVEs are individual vulnerabilities within individual software products, and there's you know tens of thousands of them that are tracked, hundreds of thousands that, that are tracked. Um, one thing that that many people don't necessarily realize is different programmers will often make the exact same kind of mistake that will create vulnerabilities within their own software. Um, you hear about SQL injection or buffer overflows or cross-site scripting. Those kinds of um, those kinds of issues exist in thousands and thousands of vulnerabilities made by thousands and thousands of developers. They're frequently repeated mistakes 
And so what we try and do within the common weakness enumeration, the CWE, is identify these weaknesses, these mistakes, and classify them and track them by their class. So just like you might have a CVE for buffer overflow in Internet Explorer 4.0, um, you would have a CWE for the class of copying a um, memory outside of the bounds of a memory buffer, something like a buffer overflow, or not preserving the structure of a SQL command when you're constructing it using user input, which is something that enables SQL injection attacks. So CWE is really trying to get at classifying the kinds of mistakes that are frequently made by many different developers. So in that we have um, we have now over I think we're over 900 different weaknesses that we try and track within CWE. So it's not on the order of hundreds of thousands, but there's that's still a lot of mistakes that developers can be making. So when I look at CWE um, and I see the 916 total weaknesses, seems like a lot, right? And and yeah. a lot to try to train and communicate and understand. So I understand that you guys also do the CWE top 25, trying to identify the most dangerous software weaknesses. Um, I also, you know, at one point there was the OWASP top 10. I feel like that started in 2004. It kind of feels like it stopped in 2017. And then there was this CWE SANS thing that started in 2009, stopped in 2011. It seems like it's back now from 19 to 20. So th there's been some efforts around trying to take a lot of issues or weaknesses, 916 of them, and get the, the top 25. Can you take just a, a brief moment to sort of talk about that CWE analysis process of how you you get those top 25 and, and then how people should read that, that report? Sure, yep. Um, so in the, um, in the days of 2009 to 2011, we what we did was we did a community oriented effort by bringing in a lot of different um, uh, code analysis tool vendors, um, security consultants, uh, academics, um, and so on who did who looked for vulnerabilities for a living and um, basically told them to get a sense and an understanding of what were the significant issues, the most significant issues that they would run into that appeared the most frequently and were the most dangerous. And um, we used effectively survey results with some rankings um, of each individual respondent to this survey. We used these survey results to then construct the top 25 um, from that. But it's a very extensive, expensive process that was still dependent on the skills and knowledge of a relatively small number of contributors, about 25 or so. And um, the OWASP top 10, um, roughly speaking, has been constructed in similar ways. Um, when we started to bring up the top 25 more actively again, um, just a couple of years ago, we wanted to be more systematic and um, able to really operate on a larger scale. So we worked with CVE identifiers as captured within NVD, the National Vulnerability Database, and those CVEs are mapped to CWE identifiers. And so then we were able to take um, not only the mappings to the CWEs, but also the CVSS score of each of those individual CVEs. And so we were able to get what kind of vulnerability or what kind of weakness was involved with the CVE, as well as what was the risk of the vulnerability, at least as CVSS characterizes it. And so we were then able to take, um, you know, the, the most frequently appearing CWEs and combine that with the overall average CVSS, which then enabled us to automatically calculate a top 25 based on uh, NVD data. And um, one, one big step that I skipped there is we went and we looked at the original mappings that NVD analysts had provided and tried to see if we could come up with more precise or more accurate mappings. So we basically re-evaluated many of the mappings that were already done. And um, that enabled us to generally provide more, more precise data, which then helped us to really 
increase our confidence in the top 25 that we generated, and then share that CWE mapping data back to NVD so that they could then go and re-update their CVE identifiers. So it's, um, uh, so it's not all 100% automated, but what we found is that there are a lot of areas where there could be improvements in how people map to CWE identifiers and a lot of improvements in how uh, uh, people could even describe vulnerabilities in a way so that you could understand the weakness in the first place. Um, so we're going to be moving forward with those kinds of lessons to really try and work with the uh, software vendor community and others to improve and to adopt CWE in the first place um, and to improve the quality of their CWE mappings to be able to provide more precise and actionable um, mappings, which then we can understand better on a large scale trend analysis, what are the most important things that people really need to uh, consider. So we're definitely going to have to have you back on the show because I have tons of questions, but we're running a little low on time here. So there are two other weaknesses. You've got common weakness scoring system, CWSS, and then you also have common weakness risk analysis framework, CWRAF, or I, I think CRAF people have said. Are these still active standards being worked on that people should look into? I, you know, when you look at the MITRE website, it looks like 2013, 2014 is the last update. But the reason I ask is in some of your medical work, you, you've, you've stated in the past that CWSS plus CRAF could potentially equal that CVSS V3 environmental score. And as they're working on CVSS V4, you know, there's a, there's a lot of these things out there that I, I, I want to make sure that our listeners could understand where they might want to take some more time to look on their own or, or again, have you back on the show to talk about. What, can you give us some quick thoughts on yeah. a lot of these other weakness uh, standards? Mm -hmm. So um, CWSS, we have not been actively maintaining that um, since, I guess, yeah, around 2013 or 2014. However, it is in use by some organizations. Um, you do need to think about CWSS in the context in which it appeared. This was in between CVSS version 2 and CVSS version 3. And if you look closely, you'll actually see some parts of CWSS showing up within CVSS version 3. Um, uh, we really wanted to try and move some of this scoring forward and to try and formalize a little bit better um, to make it more accessible to less technical people. And this is where CWRAF craft really comes into play. We had a realization that every individual weakness has a fairly limited set of technical impacts that can occur. Reading memory, writing memory, you know, writing files, causing a crash. Um, if you think about the technical impacts of most vulnerabilities, they can really be classified in a pretty narrow set of technical impacts. So, so one of the things that Craft really does is it tries to allow people to lay out a scorecard of sorts and think about, okay, for all of these different technical impacts, what are the ones that are most important for my particular device or my particular product? And what can come out of that at the end is a notion of, okay, if you're really concerned about, let's say, availability, like you might be for medical devices, um, here are the most significant, most important weaknesses that you might really want to be sure that you're concentrating on. Um, and then here's the business case. Here's the business rationale for why you really care about that. But so when we characterize things more in terms of their potential technical impacts, um, that, may, that gets a little bit closer to tying together the technical and business side of things. And I, I think in general, we, we still struggle with this as an industry. Right, you need to speak the language of the business is, is like a, a cliche practically, right? Um, but at the time, CWSS and Craft really were trying to get a good handle on that. It did not get a huge amount of pickup, but people still did um, look at that and it is still in, still in some use. And we still get inquiries about it uh, every once in a while as well. So I, I think we'll be looking, in, uh, looking into um, potential uh, changes um, in the future, or at least to see what kind of interest there is in uh, continuing to maintain that. 
Thank you for that. So as we're rounding out here, uh, I want to talk a little, a little about the security industry with you. So for an introverted guy in general, you've become pretty heavily involved in the security industry um, and really uh, becoming a, a great champion to try to make it a better, more welcoming industry. In particular, you've been involved in the past at security conferences. How has the lack of in-person security conferences, in your opinion, impacted the security industry? From the perspective of diversity and inclusion, um, I, I think it's been a net positive. Um, uh, but it's, but it's kind of hard to tell because um, at least when there were physical in-person conferences, I would be able to go and, and you know, uh, estimate the gender representation just by, you know, counting attendees, watching them go past an escalator or something like that. And there were some, uh, you know, ethical concerns about, about doing that. Um, but there is no equivalent for really doing that in virtual online conferences. Um, but as far as I know, online conferences could, upon registration, you know, ask for um, uh, gender, minority status, uh, racial minorities, um, and so on, if they wanted to, to get a better sense of what their representation was. And at the very least, compared to the, um, you know, percentages of representation that exist within the industry as tracked or as reported by various organizations, and at least see if their conference is more or less diverse than some of those, uh, some of those baselines. But um, that said, I, it does seem to me like there is greater diversity because you are removing the requirement for people to physically go and take time off to go to a conference. You're removing the requirement for paying for food or for paying for you know, a hotel. You're often removing the requirement for dealing with healthcare, uh, healthcare, um, you know, child care and so on, too much care. Um, and, and so that, that helps to increase opportunities for underrepresented groups. In addition, um, one thing that's happening now that had not happened so much five years ago is um, uh, financial support, scholarships and so on, for that are intended towards bringing in people of more diverse groups that then can help to increase the representation of those conferences and open up abilities, open up opportunities to them that would not exist um, if we were still in the physical conference world. So I would love it for conferences to try and be more systematic about understanding what, the, what their representation is and what the diversity is of their conferences. Um, people can contact me. I do have some ideas on, on this um, and some uh, uh, ideas for polling and so on. But uh, even so, even though we don't know for sure, it seems like generally there's uh, a greater diversity and representation at this point in time. And I hope that it continues um, once the pandemic is over and we start having some kinds of in-person conferences again. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the virtual events and the attendance has made it easier. The, the barriers are lower for uh, having more people who are trying to get into security or, or whatever, whatever it may be. I think that's been a very positive thing with COVID. But I, I, I do look forward to the in-person events because I think more meaningful, you know, I, I know I personally and, and you as well have had some very uh, meaningful conversations with, with lots of different folks on how they can get into the industry and learn and, and improve and all those sorts of things. So um, I'm hopefully, like you said, there'd be a balance of, of going forward, the, the good, and, good and some of the new things, but getting us, getting us back. All right. I'm going to close this out with one final question for you, Steve, and we're going to, we're going to end where it started with medical providers um, that are struggling with too much work, too many vulnerabilities, too much uncertainty about their medical devices. <laughs> What do you what do you say with, to a medical organization that's struggling, um, and and what sort of tips or tricks to get started maybe with that risk based vulnerability management program that that should help them move things forward? Um, 
one thing that can really help is to be much more hands-on with your manufacturers and much more clear with what your cybersecurity expectations are. Um, Mayo Clinic um, actually has a set of, I think it's called, the, it's informally referred to as a set of six questions, but they have a series of um, minimal requirements that they have before a manufacturer can even bring a medical device in for them to consider. And it includes things such as uh, patchability, um, you know, ability to, uh, to secure things, um, fairly clean bill of health or clean bill of health from a cybersecurity vulnerability perspective, and, um, and a, a number of other kinds of requirements. So that's something that could be very useful even for a poorly resourced um, healthcare delivery organization to do, to really make it clear to their manufacturers that cybersecurity is important to them. Perfect. Mr. Steve Christie, thank you for your time. I greatly appreciate all your thoughts today. We're gonna have to get you back on because I have like a whole bunch more questions that I didn't even get a chance to, to ask you. But I, I look forward to an in-person round of putt-putt in the near future. Stay safe and, and thanks again for your time. Thanks for the invite, Jake. I really had a lot of fun and uh, see you on the course.